This is 5 O'Clock Shadow on the Pacifica Radio Network. In today's program, there was a startling development in Japan where the government has now allowed the sale of fish from Fukushima, just off the edge of the Pacific Ocean where there is continuing radioactivity released into the ocean. There is detection of radioactivity in some uh, fish in the area. Sea bass off the coast of Japan are being thrown back because they exceed radiation limits. Bluefin tuna have traveled all the way from Fukushima to the west coast of the United States, but Japanese officials say that the locally sold test produce of fish and seafood products is safe for consumption. We'll get the latest details from nuclear expert Arnie Gunderson of Fair Winds Associates. Also, we'll continue the environmental theme today with a look at the Rio Plus 20 Earth Summit that was recently concluded. Many people say that the concept of a green economy is just a bailout for the current recession around the world. We'll hear what Bolivian President Evo Morales has to say about that. All that and more on today's edition of 5 O'Clock Shadow. I'm Robert Knight in New York. This is 5 O'Clock Shadow on the Pacifica Radio Network, originating at WBAI. I'm Robert Knight in New York, and we turn our eyes to Fukushima, where there is an odd marketing test ploy being done by officials in and around Fukushima, the site of the multiple nuclear meltdowns and disasters there, and the continuing uh, release of radioactive water into the Pacific Ocean water table in nearby areas. We're now joined live by Arnie Gunderson a nuclear engineer, licensed plant operator, and expert for Fairwinds Associates. Welcome back, Arnie. Hi, Robert. Thanks for having me. I cannot believe they're selling uh, octopus and snails off the coast of Fukushima. <laughs> well, you're right. I can't believe it either. It's, it's fascinating how they've uh, declared that octopus and, and snails are safe. They, they boiled them first, and then they checked for radiation, of course, they didn't check the water they were boiled in, but they checked the, the octopus and, and, and snails after they were boiled and claim they, they were uh, satisfactory. But the interesting thing is they're not selling them boiled. They're selling them raw, but yet the tests were done on boiled, which, of course, would drive off some of the radiation. So um, it, it, you're right. It is fascinating. Well, now, in our prior conversation, we covered the reported transit of uh, huge fish, tuna, across the Pacific Ocean from Japan to the west coast of the United States with the radiation levels that were t detected in them that could only have come from the Fukushima disaster. You spoke about how the radiation would work its way up the food chain and uh, that uh, the snapshot of the most recent uh, peer-reviewed scientific report, you said, would underestimate uh, the continuing accumulation as uh, days, weeks, months, and years go by. I'd like you to revisit that and put that in context with the alarming discovery of radiation in smaller fish near the Japanese coast, near Fukushima. There was a report that uh, we uh, discussed uh, uh, earlier today about uh, results from the Health and Labor Sciences Research Center, which found uh, disturbing levels of cesium-134 and 137. So uh, can you take us uh, through the big fish and the little fish? Um, sure. We'll, um, we'll start with the biggest fish. There, there was... Um Right after the accident, uh, cesium-137 detected in whales uh, off, off the shore. <clears throat> but um, as everyone said, no one ever tested a whale before, so we're not sure what the normal whale should have. And because it was 137, that's not a signature coming from Fukushima. You need both 134 and 137. So let's go down the food chain a little bit to, to uh, tuna. And the uh, um, but tuna were caught off the off the coast of California, they caught 15 fish, and all of them had both cesium-134 and 137, and they were, um, it was only five months after the accident, which meant, uh, I don't know, can tuna do a beeline? Or they, 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 
the, the tuna beelined for the California coast, and uh, and yet they had a body burden of cesium-134 and 137. To me, that tells me that the um, essentially every tuna in the Pacific is now um, carrying cesium-134, 137. But the report you were mentioning is, is even more frightening to, to my mind because they're um, relatively deep water fish, so they're not right on the coast. And um, I've got it in front of me. They have spotted anchovies, um, have um, the six, <clears throat> 60 becquerels per kilogram. So that means 60 clicks of a Geiger counter for every two pounds of spotted anchovies every second. Um, the, another one is something called a greenling, uh, another 60 um, counts in the Geiger counter every second for, uh, for two pounds of, of, of that fish. Um, on and on and on, even down to uh, to snow crabs, which had um, about 15 clicks, 15 becquerels per kilogram as well. Um, they're at the bottom of the food chain. So that's what the tuna are going to be eating or, or an intermediate fish and then working its way up. Um, I, I think we said uh, earlier, if we didn't, I'll say it now, I, I think those early... Um, data we got from tuna are going to be low, and we're going to find higher and higher concentrations as the year goes on. Well, one of the things that's um, important to consider in uh, this most recent uh, nonchalantly released report from the Health and Labor Sciences Research uh, Center in Japan is that uh, these these species uh, to which you refer, they're radioactivity count in uh, becquerels per kilogram was uh, separated into plutonium, uh, which uh, some of them were detected as having, uh, strontium, and um, but when it comes to the cesium, you are indicating that the present, the co-presence of 134 and 137 isotopes uh, is that which tags it to Fukushima at this point in time. And some of the reporting on this uh, study uh, suggests that the levels are half as large as need to be counted. You're, you uh, say that it's significant that uh, both species of cesium, 134 and 137, be taken into account. Can you explain that? Um, yeah, well, chemically, you know, they, 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 they're identical. So they're going to, um, just like potassium, they're going to go to bone, I'm sorry, they're going to go to muscle in your, um, in your body. So uh, it's, it's quite common when you look at the biological effect of them to combine the two. Um, cesium-134 is actually worse than cesium-137 because it's more energetic, but it has a, a shorter half-life. So while it's in your, your um, muscle, which is you know, something on the order of 10 years, um, it's more damaging, whereas the, the cesium can hang around for something on the order of a couple hundred years. Uh, so after the 134 is gone, the 137 is obviously uh, the most dangerous isotope. The, the concentration uh, that these are found at, 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 at you know, 60 to 100 disintegrations per, per second becquerels per, per kilogram um, is significant. Um, uh, the, uh, there's a, uh, the health physics community um, um, is concerned, first for just eating the anchovies and, and these these small fish, but if the small fish are at 100, the tuna will concentrate something on the order of 10 times that, and you'll be up at 1,000. Um, so this bioaccumulation as it works its way up the food chain uh, tells me that in the fish that we eat in quantity, uh, you know, like a, a tuna steak or something like that, um, uh, is likely to become contaminated as, uh, as time goes on. Well, with the radioactive anchovies being discovered off the coast of Japan near Fukushima, does that mean now that um, a pizza can melt its own cheese? <laughs> I don't like anchovies on my pizza. <laughs> <laughs> but you're right, yes, it could. Well, Arnie, what are the... Uh, disturbing aspects of this development this week of uh, selling offshore fish near Fukushima, even though the government claims that it's meeting radiation standards, is that it's being test marketed in a couple of stores near Fukushima in the prefecture there. Mm 
and uh, being sold at a discount of 30 to 40 percent less than it was before the nuclear disaster. Do you see this as uh, a test probe of having economics uh, overcome uh, concern about environmental health? Um, yeah, I, I do think so. You know, when I was in Tokyo, there was a couple of stores that specialized in Fukushima food, and my God, they had beautiful radiation detection equipment. It was their their sort of market niche, and uh, you know, to the tune of maybe having a fifty thousand dollar detector in the store. Um, I wish I had one in my lab. The, um, um, but uh, even then, uh, th- there were not many people shopping there. So there certainly is a, um, you know, resistance. And I, I really don't believe that price is over going is, is going to overcome it. You know, it's interesting because while the Japanese are allowing fish to uh, to be sold now from near Fukushima, um, South Korea just banned 35 different uh, seafood products. From Japan, this is this is also today. So here in the United States, we have this "don't ask, don't tell." You know, we don't ask the Japanese what's in it, and they don't tell us. But but um, but the South Koreans are banning Japanese imports of uh, of seafood. What about the supposed regulatory agencies, the World Trade Organization, or whatever international health bodies there may be, the United Nations, and such? Uh, could it be the case that there are no standards uh, for proper research and protection against uh, radioactivity ingestion? Why is the international regulatory system, much less TEPCO and the Japanese government, doing something that is uh, more proactively protective? Well, I've been told by by people in the State Department last year that um, that they were told by the United States government to to downplay the health effects of radiation. And so I think we've really gone out of our way not to measure. It may be that there's a standard there, and uh, um, the, the federal agencies and even the state agencies are simply not measuring the, the, the stuff. Um, I've been working on the West Coast, and, and I'm trying to get uh, um, the people in Oregon to demand of their state, the people in Alaska, demand of your state, you know, check the salmon. Um, it, it, it is not difficult it, on the order of, $500 of fish. Of course, you don't have to test every fish, but let's test a couple of fish and see and uh, either alleviate the fear or, or announce that, yes, indeed, that they are radioactive. In other words, don't ask, don't tell Becquerel. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> <laughs> this is 5 O'Clock Shadow. I'm Robert Knight in New York, and that is Arnie Gunderson of Fairwinds Associates. He is also a recent and frequent uh, traveler to Japan, where he was the guest of the Japanese National Press Club on the publication of his bestseller in the Japanese language uh, called Fukushima, the Truth and the Future. And, uh, Arnie, I understand that uh, it's not just the seafood that uh, is showing signs of radioactivity from the uh, Fukushima Daiichi disaster. What uh, other ways of detecting this that is not being published by government agencies are you aware of? Well, the, um, the freshwater fish are also contaminated, and the bottoms of streams and rivers and lakes are becoming more contaminated. You know, if you think about it, there's a lot on the ground, and, and over time the rain is going to wash it into the rivers, and it, it does collect in sediment, and then the bottom dwellers pick it and things like that. So we are seeing it in, uh, in freshwater fish, um, including freshwater fish associated with, like, major reservoirs for Tokyo. So it, it's in the food chain. But what I found disturbing, I was in, um, I was in Europe a couple of weeks ago, and I, I was speaking with a Japanese journalist who spoke fluent Italian and fluent English and came from Fukushima Prefecture, and um, she agreed to have um, people within the prefecture send us the dust from inside the vacuum cleaners. And we're beginning, so this is household dust, and we're now finding um, contamination in the household dust exceeding 10,000 disintegrations per second, 10,000 becquerels per second per kilogram of dust. Now, you know, two pounds of dust is a lot of dust, but what I'm, what I'm getting at here is that the, the household dust in Fukushima Prefecture is uh, you couldn't throw that bag out 
um, it should be treated as, as radioactive waste at the numbers we're, we're seeing. And, in fact, the people are just not aware of it. So when you see people walking around with these, you know, the Geiger counter held in air, <clears throat> and those numbers are, are, are relatively low, I believe that, but it's not an indication of what they're really exposed to. I mean, you know, the Japanese sleep on uh, on beds that they roll out on the floor, which is exactly where the dust is. So the issue is the, the internal contamination that these people are either breathing in or imbibing uh, other ways. We've also got um, people in Tokyo who are sending house filters, not, not vacuum cleaner filters, but whole house filters. And um, while down from last year, they are still showing significant levels of, of cesium as well. So we know it's airborne as far out as, um, as Tokyo. And we know it's, um, it's in the soil being carried in on, on feet and, um, and in the households in, in Fukushima Prefecture. Um, the, the net effect of all that um, will be determined in 20 or 30 years as this stuff um, you know, causes cancer. My biggest concern is for women and for young children, both of which are much more radio sensitive than you know, an old guy like me. Mm. You... Um we're also in communication with Marco Kaltofen, who was involved, I believe, as well with the study about the um, uh, the, the uh, vacuum bags and the air filters of automobiles. Well, Marco has actually not been involved in the vacuum bags. That's a, a, mm -hmm. an, uh, another scientist. And, yeah, uh, he did uh, an extensive um, project on um, air filters for cars, and uh, uh, those are truly hideous, the... the uh, you can go up on our website and see the pictures, but uh, an air filter for a car and driven in normal use breathes in about the same amount of air as a person in the course of a day. And um, the air filters for cars we found in Fukushima Prefecture last year are um, are just awful. The, um, the, the way we test them is we put the air filter on an x-ray sheet and put that in a, in a dark safe for something on the order of a week. Well, the Fukushima... Um, air filters were so radioactive that they turned the air filter, they turned the x-ray film white. We had to put them in for less time because they were literally, you know, completely burning the x-ray film. This is last year's data now. It's not new. Um, we're still seeing it, not to the same degree. But the, again, the, the international community is measuring the wrong thing. They're looking at external radiation from a handheld detector. And they're not looking at what these people are, are, are imbibing or breathing in. We're speaking with Arnie Gunderson of Fairwinds. The web address is fairwinds.com, F-A-I-R-E-W-I-N-D-S. And, uh, Arnie, I think we need also today to do a uh, state of the units uh, review of Fukushima Daiichi and, um, uh, certainly the scene of uh, multiple meltdowns at Units 1, 2, and 3. But uh, we uh, keep our attention on Unit Number 4, where there is a bathtub perched atop a birdhouse, where there, the spent fuel pool overloaded from um, the uh, defueling of Unit Reactor Number 4 is uh, sitting precariously, according to some estimates. And uh, just uh, this week... The Japanese government and TEPCO admitted that there is a warping, a stressing of the walls of the Unit 4 building and uh, insisting that uh, there is nothing about that about which to worry. Can you bring us up to date on Unit 4? Um, yeah, uh, I, I loved your comment last time about um, um, when the bow breaks, the baby will fall. That's uh, sort of where we remain. Uh, it's interesting. The Japanese announced that the, the wall had bulged um, on, the, on two sides of the, uh, um, the Fukushima Unit uh, 4, um, and that's, of course, the one that has the most fuel and the hottest fuel and the, and the most risk to, um, uh, to cut Japan in half or to cause the evacuation of Tokyo should it fail. Now, this is really in the weeds, but when you see a building buckle like that, it's actually called a first-mode Euler strut buckle, and it's caused by a seismic-induced stress. So, of course, the industry has been saying all along that, well, these plants withstood the earthquake perfectly well. 
But buckling like we're seeing in Unit 4 is an indication that perhaps they didn't ride out the earthquake anywhere near as well as we thought. The first order Euler stress, would that be E-U-L-E-R? Yes. Mm. Named after the famous mathematician. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, the Unit 4 spent fuel pool at the latest report of which I'm aware, has had a tarpaulin, a plastic sheet, uh, put on top of it. What is the state and uh, complexity and reliability of the attempt to keep the remnant reactions of the fuel cool? I think that, sh that sheet is to keep people from falling in and to keep material from falling in because they are going to begin to build a, a, a structure over top of it. So... The, the tarpaulin-like cover or, or drum head, if you will, that they did put over top of the um, fuel pool, um, I don't believe it was meant to hold any radiation in, but in fact was designed to, you know, the last thing you want is for somebody to drop an I-beam and for that I-beam to go crashing into the nuclear fuel. And I think this was um, designed to, uh, to catch construction rubble as it fell. So they uh, put a big trampoline over the lid of it. Yes, exactly. We're going to turn you into an engineer then. <laughs> the uh, the uh, other problem is that some uh, that people are saying that the pool should be depopulated, that the fuel should be taken out uh, in yes. case of the risk of uh, losing the water, losing the cooling, zirconium, uh, zircaloy fires and such. And uh, I, I don't think we've spoken much about why that is not feasible because of the destruction of the reliability of the uh, rolling crane that typically uh, lies above such facilities. No, that's exactly right. The, the tarpaulin that they put there um, is going to have to have a large building put over the top and for an enormous crane, one that can handle something on the order of 150 tons. Um, and that crane has to lift into the pool uh, a very heavy shielded uh, cask. Only when that happens can they then lift the individual fuel bundles out and put it in that in that heavily shielded cask. This can't be done by a construction crane because one, they mm. uh, even though they look robust, they can't lift a hundred tons. But the other problem is that um, they're not redundant. And if um, if the cable were to snap on a construction crane while it was carrying a 100-ton cast over the fuel pool, um, the cast would burst right through, you know, seven stories of, of, um, of the building and, and drain the pool in no time. So you have to be very careful not to drop the cask. So they'll build a building over top of this pool so they can lift in this heavily shielded cask. Once that's, that heavily shielded cask is underwater, they will very gingerly lift out the nuclear fuel bundles underwater because they are so radioactive they would you know, kill the operating crew on the operating deck if they were um, to, to lose water. They'll then put those into the cask and lift them out using that same heavy lift crane. Hmm. I believe it's Kirchhoff's law that uh, says that the amount of the thing going into a node equals the amount of the thing coming out of the node. About the water that is being used to try and keep the spent fuel pool cooled. What is the What happens to the water that is circulated into it? Does it really all come back and get recirculated, or is there still leakage into the water table and the Pacific? The, there definitely is leakage in the, into the water table and into the Pacific from all of the units. Um, I don't think you can quantify whether it's predominantly from Unit 4 or Unit 1 or whatever. But the, the, the buildings continue to leak into the water table and into the Pacific. Now, I went on record a year ago saying that the, a solution should be to build a trench and fill it about, about two meters wide, six feet wide by 60 feet deep, and uh, fill it with something called zeolite, which is a volcanic material that absorbs radiation. And I was told, quite frankly, that Tokyo Electric didn't have the money to build a trench around the, around the facility. So uh, a lot of good engineering solutions uh, seem to be uh, limited um, not by the creativity of engineers but by the ability of uh, Tokyo Electric to fund um, 
what what could easily be important dose minimizing um, uh, missions. Well, um, this is quite a uh, severe survey that uh, you bring us today of the circumstances at Fukushima. We've been speaking with Arnie Gunderson, a Fairwinds associate, uh, and the author of Fukushima, The Truth and the Future. And uh, Arnie, in the minute or two that we have uh, uh, now, I'd like you to tell us about uh, what you're doing or how people can um, learn more through Fairwinds or other methods as well. Well, June one is, uh, July 1 is a very important day in Japan. Um, the Ohi units are scheduled to start up, and there's enormous popular pressure not to. Um, every Friday for the last three weeks, people have surrounded the, um, the, the, the building in which the prime minister lives. Two weeks ago, there was 10,000. Uh, a week ago, there was 45,000, and they're expecting 100,000 uh, this week. So um, I think uh, you know, your, your listeners might want to uh, keep an eye on that, although mainstream media hasn't covered it. Um, also, Fairwinds is going to be putting up on the, on the first uh, a new video. We've been invited to uh, be the, the kickoff act for the uh, the Japanese Peace Film Festival, and so we've got a um, a new video discussing um, the fact that Japan has alternatives that they don't have to go back and fire up 50 nuclear plants. Um, they can um, they can engineer their way out of this using alternatives over the next 10 years, like the, like the Germans are planning to do. Um, and I think those are the lessons I'd like to leave with your listeners. Well, thank you so much. I uh, commend uh, attention to your website at fairwinds.com and uh, support for someone who's doing some very important research and teaching. Thank you, Arnie Gunderson. Thanks for having me.